<clears throat> Hi, I'm Tecla Cunningham, co-artistic director of Pacific Music Works, and I've been asked to give you a little bit of an introduction to the Baroque violin. So I have two instruments that I'd like to show you. One is from the, a copy of an instrument from 1600, the beginning of what we think of as the Baroque. And this is a copy of a Polish instrument from a museum in um, Krakow. It was made actually here right on the Sailor Sea in Port Townsend by Stefan Pokalski. Um, and it has some rather unusual features, one of which is that it does not, it has a painted on purfling and a stained fingerboard, very much like the um, Mittenwald violin school where they stained and um, often pear wood instead of using ebony. Um, the back is a beautiful one piece back. Um, has a Baroque bridge, which is a little bit lighter than a modern bridge and the angles are a little different. So it's a bit easier to play chords. The strings are made of sheep's gut. The lowest string that I have is wound in silver. Um, and it has kind of a different shape of the neck. It's a little bit flatter um, and thicker as well. So it kind of sits in the hand nicely. And in this earlier Baroque music, people didn't shift as much. You were mostly in the lowest position. So having a comfortable thing here was easier than being able to get around up really high. Uh, the Let's see here, I'll show you another violin, which is um, from kind of a high Baroque violin um, from 1746 from Venice, Italy, made by the great maker Sanctus Seraphim. He married into the Montagnana family in Venice so that he could participate in the guild uh, system. I think he married one of the Montagnana daughters and got his guild card. Um, and so this has a very different coloring of varnish. You'll notice on both of these instruments, there's no chin rest, there's no shoulder rest. This one retains a, um, someone at some point up, updated this, so it has a little bit of a modern neck, but I didn't want to take the whole thing apart again to put it all the way back together. So um, there's a beautiful Baroque bridge made by David Van Zant, the great luthier, and a flat tailpiece. And then inside there's a sound post, which is also a bit thinner than a modern sound post. I'll show you some bows next. So here's a little tiny bow. This is a little bit like a, kind of like um, Italians seem to be good at making wonderful small things that go quickly. So like a little bit like a Ferrari. So this bow is great at doing the quick ornaments um, that are so common in 17th century Italy. Wonderful at imitating kind of vocal articulations. And instead of having a screw to tighten the hair, you can see all my little leather wedgy things that I kind of wedge in there to adjust the tension. And it's quite short, so I'll show you the end of the bow. And it has a convex curve. So the bow, I would say, um, one way to think about it is the Baroque violin is under lower tension than the modern violin. And the Baroque bow is usually under much higher tension than a modern bow. So it just creates a different, different balance. Um, the next bow is a high Baroque bow. Um, this one is by Steve Marvin, the great bow maker in Toronto, Canada, also a wonderful violinist. Um, and this model is called the Stradivarius model. So that's always exciting. Um, so Stradivarius, of course, was the great Italian um, violin maker. And there aren't, I don't, this is sort of a little bit of musical conjecture. It's not a direct copy. I think he used a little bit of his imagination from his many years as a bow maker and player. Um, so again, you can notice that that convex curve, this one is longer. It has a beautiful flamed stick. Um, and this one has an, um, a titanium screw in it so the his totally historic copy would have been like the one before that I showed you in which you adjusted the tension with little leather scraps and this one has a convenient little pin to turn and I'll show you one more bow which is a classical era bow that I'm going to use next week at Sanctuary in the City for playing string quartets by Haydn and Sermon and Mozart and um, this one is also by um, Steve Marvin in Toronto it has this beautiful orange gold winding that I just love. Um, contemporary makers, um, or I, I should say in the classical and Baroque era, ma makers would have used ivory and that's now a band material. So we have um, mastodon, which is extinct and somehow that's okay to use. So they use mastodon. It's, the hair is horse hair. It's taken from the horse's tail, usually from uh, Mongolia. And here you can see that shift has started to take place. So rather than the convex, um, curve of the Baroque bow. This one has a little gentle concave curve. 
and it's quite a bit longer and it has an, a very different tip. So I'll hold up the Baroque bow so you can see. So this is quite a significant change and um, both in the, the camber of the bow, which is how we describe the, the angle or the with the curvature of the stick. Um, <clears throat> so this one is already much um, more suited to playing longer, longer lines, phrases are getting longer, um, sung lines, so think about a beautiful Mozart slow movement and how you wanna be able to have kind of enough wind in your sails to get through that without changing the bow. That's what this bow is starting to really get good at. So it's a transition between um, the Baroque bow and the modern bow. So that's a little quick introduction. You've, um, if you've been to our concerts, you've heard some combination of all of these instruments, um, except for <laughs> this little blondie, um, but maybe that'll, that'll come up someday. So that's kind of an, an, an extra violin, and um, it's just delightful to have something made in the neighborhood, so to speak. So um, thanks again for your support for Give Big, and hope this was informative, and looking forward to seeing you at our next performances. Thank you.